Good evening and welcome. I am Sophie Mehta, the conference chair for Branksome, and I am joined here by Connor Healy, the UCC conference chair. 2015 is a big year for the World Affairs Conference. It is my distinct pleasure to declare the 32nd annual World Affairs Conference, the largest in our history, officially open. Thank you, Sophie. Tonight we are joined by two extraordinary individuals. For the Lionel Gelbert keynote address, Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald will be discussing privacy rights in the modern age. Snowden is perhaps the most wanted man in the whole world. A year and a half ago, he released classified documents revealing domestic espionage in the US and elsewhere on a scale that was previously unimaginable. Greenwald made global headlines in June 2013 when he, along with Laura Poitras, released the Snowden documents. The revelations resulting from his brave journalism have catalyzed a, glo a global debate over the balance between national security and personal privacy. A few pieces of housekeeping before we start. After the discussion, Snowden and Greenwald will be taking questions for 30 to 40 minutes That's a good time, um, from students only. Please refrain from the use of flash photography, as apparently it does something to the cameras. And without further ado, please joining me in welcoming Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald. Um, I believe we had an issue with Glenn Greenwald, so if he's not on there now, he'll be joining us in a few minutes. But Ed, I'd like to start with you. Let's start at the beginning. What are PRISM, Bull Run, and Levitation? Who is involved in them? And what about them caused the two of you to blow the whistle? So when we think about the issues that were revealed beginning June 2013, it was a departure from the traditional model of intelligence gathering and security that we've always had in the United States and much of the Western world in general. And that's the idea that we have intelligence agencies, we have sort of spy agencies uh, that work in secret to defend us on a national basis, but they use their extraordinary powers only in extraordinary circumstances when it's truly necessary and that they use it in the most targeted, most limited way uh, that's absolutely necessary to achieve their purpose. So the difference was the PRISM program, for example, uh, it would be uh, something like this. This is the second part of PRISM. You'll notice uh, corporate slides or corporate logos up at the top that everyone's familiar with. These were what were called the PRISM partners. They were corporate uh, corporations in the United States that had collaborated uh, in secret with the United States government to turn over the private information from individual to accounts. Uh, and these would be uh, these would be individuals who had been suspected of some wrongdoing in a general sense, but without actually receiving a warrant against them signed by a judge from any court. Instead, these were warrants that were sort of self-signed by intelligence agencies without the involvement of any law enforcement or any judge. And what it meant was the massive amounts of information that were available on every person uh, who has a, a Google account or an iPhone or they use Facebook or Skype, uh, any of these services that are so necessary to all of us were suddenly immediately exposed in a way that we had never seen before. The Bull Run program was a program that collected uh, basically communications. It was used against communications that had been collected in bulk in an untargeted manner. So they weren't looking for, say, specific terrorists here or a particular criminal here. They were collecting information about all of us. And some of these communications were encrypted. They were protected using methods of digital security. Uh, that are common, they're used by every website. This isn't a scary thing, it's what you use when you log into your bank or you order something online. Uh, that kind of general encryption that all of us rely on for basic safety. 
That was being undermined in secret uh, by the UK government and the US government together under programs called uh, Bull Run and Edge Hill. Now interestingly, the names of these programs are references to Civil War battles. And that reflects the idea that they were targeting basically uh, not just people on the outside, but people within. This is a fundamental change where, again, they're departing from the idea that we're looking for the worst of the worst in faraway places. Instead, we're looking inside at everyone in a new way, and the public wasn't aware of this. Now, Levitation was just revealed. This is a program that was revealed, I, I believe, about a week ago uh, in Canada. It was a program by uh, the Canadian equivalent of the National Security Agency, sort of the electronic spying agency in the U.S. Uh, our Canadian counterparts were intercepting everybody's communications they could get a hold of that were related to file sharing uh, sites, what are called uh, FFUs or uh, free file upload sites. If anybody in the room has shared a file, and you know this is uh, fairly common among younger people, uh, I'm not just talking about BitTorrent, but you know things like Rapid Upload, uh, Mega Upload, uh, Send Space, any of these very common sites where you might upload like you know a, a video or a clip or an image, something like that. They were collecting all of this information about everybody and storing it, and then they were running analytics on it on a bulk scale to try to identify terrorist material. Now the danger behind this is once government collects sort of massive amounts of information on individuals, even if these are what's called you know metadata, which is not the actual picture itself, but say a link to the picture, you know the the URL where it's hosted on the server, along with the time that it was accessed, along with the IP address, the internet address of your home or your phone or whatever device you were using that was used to upload it. Uh, this reveals a lot about individuals. Uh, it says where you live, it says who you are associating with, who your friends are, uh, depending on the content of these images, which can later be retrieved. Uh, it could be you know, who you're, who you're uh, in love with, who you're dating, uh, what your political interests are, your religious interests are, all kinds of information about us. Uh, and metadata, this sort of data about data, is considered by governments, and this was established in secret. This has never really been established by courts in a robust, uh, survivable way. Metadata is used, according to the former director of National Security Agency and Central Intelligence Agency, my, my former boss, Michael Hayden, we use metadata to kill people. It's what we use for targeting drone strikes. This is incredibly powerful, incredibly sensitive data, but courts, in secret, decided that they didn't have the same legal protections that the content of your emails would have, the actual body of the emails. They can collect who you're emailing with, when you're emailing them, which says like when you're awake, when you go to sleep, when you go to school, where you're traveling, uh, what computers you connect to, are you connecting from your home, your friend's house. All of this information was being collected in secret. And these are only three programs. Many, many more have been revealed since 2013. But the general context of all of it is that what changed was we were no longer looking just for bad guys. We were no longer just monitoring terrorists. We were monitoring entire populations, entire societies, entire nations, classes of people without regard to the impact that it has on them and without regard to the fact that this fundamentally changes the balance of power between the citizen and the state. And when this happens in secret, when this happens outside of the context of public law, public debate, and public consent, not only does this change the nature of our democracy, it changes our ability to control our governments. Because if they're not accountable to the public, ultimately, who are they accountable to at all? I'm sorry, I, uh, I can't hear you. Uh, one minute. Hello? Yes, I'm here. All right. Welcome back. Sorry about that. <laughs> could, you, could you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Little disclaimer, guys. This may happen from time to time. 
Uh, like you said, the issue at hand is broader than personal privacy. Some might say that the entire relationship between the citizen and the state is changing. Broadly speaking, what would you say the conduct of the NSA and other government agencies says about the state of Western democracies? And where else, other than privacy, does this change manifest itself? This is a very complicated question. It can be addressed in a number of different ways. But what we need to think about most fundamentally is how our values as a nation, how our values as societies, and broadly how our values as a sort of um, collaborative Western civilization say not just to us internally, but to our adversaries externally. You know, it's very common for us to criticize China and Russia and these countries because they're very authoritarian. They have terrible laws. Uh, particularly when we're speaking about internet freedom, um, privacy, ability to communicate without prejudgment, without the interference of state security bureaus, things such as this. Uh, there's strong crackdowns on dissent. But when we begin passing laws that provide the same powers that we criticize to our own government, what we're doing is we're writing a pass to our adversaries not only to do the same things, but to take them further. And when we do this under the context of secrecy, when we do this without, again, the awareness and involvement of the public, when we sort of take away the public's seat at the table of our government, we're losing our way as a society, and we're losing our commitment to democratic participation. And this is what gives us the moral authority to really set international standards and norms of behavior. When we abandon that, we lose our ability to lead. And this has a far more significant impact on us uh, nationally and in terms of national security, as opposed to the very limited, very targeted threats that we were originally facing. Yes, we face real problems and real dangers from uh, capable actors and, and people who want to do us harm outside. You know, there are real terrorists out there. There's not a lot of them. They are few in number. And when you look at it statistically, they carry, kill uh, very few. More people die from bathtub falls and, you know, lightning strikes, car accidents and cheeseburgers, you know, heart attacks than do from terrorists. But we commit a disproportionately large amount of national effort and national resources to combating this relatively limited terrorist threat. It's the same thing with cybersecurity and so on and so forth. What we need to ask is, does the public agree with these policies, particularly when we think about the combined, uh, the combined impact that we're not just paying with material resources. We're not just paying in terms of money and people in offices their focus. We're paying in terms of liberties and rights. Because when we provide the government ability to secretly invade all of our homes, all of our bedrooms, there's another program called Optic Nerve in the United Kingdom, uh, part of the Five Eyes Alliance of the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, the Optic Nerve program allows the British basically to turn on your webcam to activate these feeds. Uh, it's actually intercepting people's instant message communications. They're using sort of web-based uh, video chats like uh, Yahoo Messenger. Uh, and suddenly, we realize that not only are people monitoring our public behaviors when we're outside of our homes, they're monitoring our travels through our phones, they're monitoring the purchases we make, they're monitoring our associations, uh, and they're also monitoring us inside of our homes. And when we had no ability to weigh in on this, this has a very significant impact on the way we live. Mr. Snowden, if you could take the entire budget of the NSA and redirect it elsewhere, what would you do with it? <laughs> well, I, I don't want to presume to direct policy. You know, this is a democratic process. It should be done by everybody, and I don't want to say that, you know, I'm the person who has the answers. None of us have the answers. Together we find the answers. We have to work together on this. What I will say is there is value for the NSA. There is value for CSEC. We do need these uh, agencies because they provide a significant, uh, they provide a significant strategic resource in times of real conflict, in times of total war. Uh, you know, when we have sort of submarines off our coast, 
when we're worried about nuclear launches, when we're involved in active hot shooting wars, uh, we need to have these capabilities and you can't turn them on overnight. So you have to, much like a standing army, you have to maintain them to a certain level. But this should be a level that is necessary and proportionate relevant to the threat faced. And when we talk about the rhetoric that's coming out of some of our politicians, they speak about things like uh, particular religions, uh, the threat of terrorism and things like that, as though they're existential threats, as though you know our, our societies are one or two days away from collapse We'll have boots on the ground, men with rifles marching through our streets that are you know, under foreign flags. And this isn't really realistic. We have to be able to balance this and think about, do we get a greater measure of security from having a more effective economy, from having a, a healthier population, from having better research, better jobs, things that help and benefit everybody every day, or having extraordinarily capable secret police? and state security bureaus that may be the best in the world, but they can just as easily be turned against our public as they can be turned against other publics. I think Glenn Greenwald may have just joined us, but I could be wrong. Are you there? I am here. I don't know if I can be heard. Brilliant. I thought we can hear you, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Um, just so you know, Glenn and Edward, there are about 900 people in this room, the vast majority of which are high school age students, and then in the other room there are an additional 400. And so despite the massive amount of snow that we talked about earlier, people have come out nonetheless. Um, and we're also live casting broad to what I believe is up to 10,000 people, and I'm not sure what the exact number is now. And so. Having said that there are Canadian student, students in the audience, only days ago documents were released implicating the Canadian government in similar domestic data collection as that undertaken by the United States. As Canadian students, why should we care and what is the cost to us of these programs? Not just in tangible monetary terms, but to our rights, liberties, and democracy. And that's just as much a question for Glenn as Edward. Glenn, why don't okay, you I will start. Topic? Sure, sure. Um, you know, first of all, I, I think it's interesting that there has been a much greater degree of support for the disclosures that we were able to make as a result of Edward Snowden's um, courageous decision to become a whistleblower among young people around the world than older people. And I think that's because younger people have had the internet be a central part of their lives from the very start and understand how critical privacy is to be able to get the value of it that it really offers. Um, the ability to be able to read and speak and explore um, and experiment is something that the internet uniquely provides and we're able to do that only if we feel like we're having a place where we can go where people aren't monitoring and judging and storing and collecting what it is that we're doing. If you have the internet become a venue of unlimited surveillance, which is really what the Canadian government and the U.S. and the British government um, has set out to do explicitly in their own documents, it really guts a core purpose of the internet, which is to enable people to find out who they are, to explore the world in a way that, especially when you're young, um, requires the ability to do it without having it trace you and tail you for the rest of your lives. There's also a lot of history that proves that when people who wield political power can monitor their citizenry in the dark, that that power inevitably will be abused. Um, it's easy for a government to say that they only monitor people who are terrorists or who are threats, um, but it's a lot harder for them to say specifically what they mean by that. Usually people who wield political power understand the terms terrorism or threats much differently than you understand it. They usually mean it as somebody who in some way poses a challenge to the exercise of their power, which is why surveillance is used almost always against dissidents or people who have opposing views or who want to work against those who wield political and economic power. And so I think if you're somebody who wants to preserve the right, not just for yourself, but for other people to engage in political dissent or to challenge those in power, it's crucial 
that we have privacy. And then the last point I would make is, and it's a much more practical one, you know, there's been a lot of terrorist attacks, as we would call them, or as our governments call them, over the past five or six years. Um, there was obviously just one in, in, in Paris. There was one in Ottawa um, when I was there three or four months ago, and, and one before that in, in, in northern Quebec, um, and one at the Boston Marathon where the trial just began. And I think the question becomes, if our government is spending so much money to turn the Internet into this vast surveillance venue, why haven't these plots been detected and I think one important question to ask ourselves is if the government is monitoring people indiscriminately the reporting we just did with the CBC showed that millions of file uploads are being collected and stored and monitored by the CBC or by the by CSEC rather um, is it really possible for governments to do their jobs in finding terrorist plots or are they just collecting so much information about so many people including people who have done nothing wrong that they become incapable of finding what they say they're looking for. Wouldn't it be much better to have our governments target their surveillance at people where there's evidence to believe they've actually engaged in wrongdoing? And I think that's a real question that we have to start asking about our governments who are engaged in mass surveillance. If I could uh, tag on to that, I, I would say uh, he's absolutely right in terms of the, the distraction I've, uh, I worked at the NSA. I was at the office on the day of the Boston Marathon. Uh, and I was in the cafeteria as the, the news was breaking. It was air, fairly early in the day in Hawaii, but you know, late in the day uh, on the Eastern Seaboard. And I, I looked at uh, one of my colleagues there, and I said, you know, I, I'd be willing to bet almost anything. We knew who these guys were. We had something on them. Uh, and, and sure enough, later on, it was it was confirmed that we had been flagged about these individuals. We knew they were a threat. But the problem with mass surveillance is that when you collect everything, you understand the number. And we have to get away from that. It's much like torture, which we had a recent debate on in, in the United States. Um, we don't have any evidence that it works. We have significant evidence that it likely does not work. Beyond that, even if it did work, it does not matter because it more basic ethical level. I mean, it doesn't matter whether or not slavery is a sound economic policy if it is morally bankrupt. The same principle applies with mass surveillance. Uh, but these programs take resources away. They take analysts away from the traditional means of targeted surveillance that we know work, that do stop attacks, that have done so for years, that work uh, effectively in investigations, that protect us from our adversaries. Uh, and this is much like the traditional means of interrogation, rapport building, where we try to become friends, we try to understand the person we're trying to gain information from who's in custody, that works when torture simply does not. Uh, we, can't, we can't avoid that. We have to make sure that we have our priorities right, we have our ethics right, and we're applying our resources effectively. The other thing was he mentioned, uh, he, he mentioned how young people Hey, Ed, do you mind yes. if I just interject? It sounds kind of like you're playing whack-a-mole or something. So, I, I don't know what's going I assume going. that's, uh, Glenn, if you have your uh, your mic unmuted and you're typing, maybe? Or I think we, we're pretty sure it's Glenn's mic. <laughs> we're, we're certain it's Glenn. Okay. I, I think it's Ed. Oh. <laughs> we, we can see it, Glenn, when you, when you press a button. <laughs> Um, Hopefully the sound effects won't continue. Uh, anyway, um, but with, with, with young people and having a better understanding of the issue, I, I have to say that you know a lot of people in this room, uh, they probably understand very well what it means to have an imbalance between your liberties and your rights. And what I mean by that is to be treated as a child, but to be expected to act like an adult. And this is what we see increasingly happening across all age groups throughout our societies. The rights that we as citizens uh, enjoy are being secretly and through authoritarian means curtailed and limited and reshaped without our awareness and without our consent. We don't really have a choice in the matter. And if we don't stand up, if we don't say what we think those rights should be, and if we do not defend them, we will find very quickly that we do not have them. And it does not matter whether we as individuals specifically need that right. 
we have to think about what it means for us as members of a class. If the person to our left or our right needs that right, we have a civic duty, we have a social obligation to stand up not just for what matters to us, but for what matters or to ourselves, but what matters to all of us as a community and as people. Mr. Stonen, could you outline exactly what you did in early 2013? Late, late, late 2013, and do you believe you acted responsibly? So this has been a topic of, uh, of much debate. Uh, what I did was I gathered information that was related to the overreach of government surveillance programs and that revealed deception in official claims of government that they had made to the public, uh, sometimes in contravention of the law. Uh, we had seen uh, some issues where, for example, uh, courts in the United States had just a few months beforehand said they would not rule on the legality of surveillance programs because they felt that you know the executive branch of government, sort of the prime minister or the president, could be trusted to do the right thing and that courts simply did not have enough expertise to defend our rights or to, to say where they should be. Now, in the wake of these disclosures, where I worked with journalists, I met with uh, Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras and Ewan McCaskill uh, in a, a hotel room in Hong Kong. I also worked with a fourth journalist, Barton Gelman at the Washington Post, uh, who were representing US news outlets. And I said, we need to get this information back to the American people. Now, I don't want to publish this information personally. I don't want to call the shots about what people should and should not know because I have a political bias or I would not have been able to do this. You know, it's somewhat politically radical to say this classified information is improperly classified, this reflects criminal activity, or it reflects simple wrongdoing even if it is lawful because legality is quite distinct from morality. Um, and the mere existence of legalism should not protect this information from the awareness of the public. We have to know this if we're going to be part of our government. So I entrusted this to these journalists and I asked them to make uh, public interest publication decisions where they would review these documents. They would say, these uh, programs, we agree as journalists, as institutions of the press, uh, should be known by the public. But even though the whistleblower sort of agreed that this is of public interest, the journalists agreed that this is of public interest, we will also go to the government in advance of publication, alert them as to what we are going to publish, and give them an opportunity to review the document and say basically, is there something that these other parties simply weren't aware of that's incredibly dangerous within them. And if that was the case, if there was some specifically dangerous uh, uh, detail in there, they would be able to make the case to the journalists that this should be redacted, this should not be included in the final article, because it's related to, say, the specific name of a human source or a particular target that's ongoing, uh, that has a successful operation that's necessary for national security. And when we combine these steps in aggregate, there's a very strong case to be made that the public good was maximized and any potential harms were minimized because you represented uh, the press and the government and the public all in one sort of negotiation process. And basically by trying to reflect the same checks and balances that are so common in Western governments in the process of publication, we could use a fairly conservative publication program. We've actually received a, a significant amount of criticism that enough has not been published, sort of that we've held too much back. Um, but in this manner, I think it is fair to say that it was responsible and very little harm has been done. Uh, in fact, we had the director of the National Security Agency, the new director, the last one got kicked out as a result of these disclosures, uh, sometime later, although they said it was, of course, planned. He was just retiring, uh, but he sort of got shuffled out of his position in place. He gave testimony last year in front of the Congress in the United States, and he said despite these disclosures and despite sort of the overheated claims that we're all at risk and there's a lot of danger now, uh, the sky is not falling. 
the NSA can continue its work where it is necessary, uh, and we're not really at, at extraordinary risk. You know, the, the, the sky isn't going to boil off, uh, and, and we're not all going to die. Tomorrow, the sun will rise again. And I, I think that's a testament to the extraordinary care that the journalists put into the process, and that's why they won the Pulitzer Prize for public service. I just want to go back to a point you made earlier about the press. Uh, can we talk about the press for a minute? Have they exceeded your expectations, met your expectations? Do you think they've focused too much on you as an individual and not enough on the issues that you meant to bring to light? How have you perceived their reaction? So this is a sort of a complicated topic. We, we've got sort of uh, the journalists that I work with, that I partnered with, who are the, in charge of the primary source material. Uh, they're reporting this actively. They've done an extraordinary job, I think. Uh, a number of different outlets, uh, institutions, The Guardian, The Washington Post, even The New York Times, Der Spiegel. Uh, even in Canada, we have a number of outlets reporting it. We have some in Brazil. Uh, Around the world, there's been a significant effort that has been uh, extraordinarily enlightening. It's resulted in uh, challenges in courts. Um, it has uh, resulted in new policy debates. It has resulted in changes in law in some places. Uh, it has resulted in inquiries into behaviors. Uh, tremendous public goods have come as a result of their hard work. But when we talk about the mass media, there has been sort of an over-fascination with myself uh, they create narratives, sort of this idea of, you know, hero or traitor and that kind of thing, which really distract from the topic at hand, which is how do these programs, this significant change in the operations of our government, affect us and the way we want to live? Uh, because whether or not I'm Mother Teresa or Adolf Hitler, that has no bearing whatsoever on the content of the reporting. Uh, who I am really is, is of, of least concern when we're talking about programs and, and, and policies of government. You know, one individual should not be held up uh, to the same level of importance or debate or scrutiny uh, as the reporting itself. And I would say we've gotten away from that recently, and that's been tremendously uh, helpful. But anytime you see people asking, you know, trigger or hero questions, typically you should think, uh, you know, is this really even worth considering? It's somewhat of a distraction. And uh, Glenn, anything to say on that? Yeah, I actually do have something to say. I was um, reading a, a, an article by a, in a Canadian outlet. It might have been the Globe and Mail or, or um, the Toronto Star. I forget which one it was. but. Apparently, the, the fact that there was this event tonight um, and that Mr. Snowden had been invited was a source of some controversy among some students and I guess some of their parents. And I read a comment by one of the parents of, of one of the students who said something like, well, Mr. Snowden admitted that he stole this material and I don't think he should be held up as an example um, to my child and to, to other children. And I would love to be able to have a conversation with that person. I, he probably wouldn't want to have one with me, but I would love to have one with him um, and, and, and be able to explore that a little bit. And I know there are other people who think that because when I was growing up, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, the person who I was taught to regard as a political hero um, was named Daniel Ellsberg, who, very similar to Mr. Snowden, um, was working in the U.S. government at a high level and, and discovered that his government, the U.S. government, was lying to the American people for many, many years about the Vietnam War. And what he did was he took what became known as the Pentagon Papers, thousands of, of top secret documents, without authorization, and he gave them to the New York Times so that the New York Times could do its job of informing the American public about that which they should have known, but which their government was hiding from them. And I guess on some level you could say that Mr. Ellsberg stole that material and that he took it um, and gave it to the New York Times without permission. And yet, I think today, Daniel Ellsberg is widely regarded as a hero. And it's not surprising that he has become one of Mr. Snowden's leading and most vocal advocates, because if you look at the last 10 years, when the United States and the Canadian government and the British government have led what they call this war on terror, the secret to it, the key to it, has been that most of what they do has been kept secret from us. Not just the specific plans and all the details, but the broad strokes of it. 
And you really can't have a democracy if you have your governments that call themselves democratic keeping from you the vast majority of the most important things they're doing because it's not very meaningful for you to go to the ballot box and pick which government you want to have power if you have no idea what they're doing. And so it isn't just Mr. Snowden, it's a long line of people, Daniel Ellsberg and Thomas Drake and Chelsea Manning and all sorts of people who came forward to reveal torture and abuse of detainees at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo um, who have let us know what our government is doing and these people are strengthening democracy. And so if you want to say, as that parent said, that Edward Snowden isn't a good example or Daniel Ellsberg isn't, you have to say that it would be better if we didn't know that our government was lying to us about the Vietnam War, or it would be better if we didn't know that our government is turning the internet without our knowledge into a venue of mass spying, or it would be better if we didn't know that our government tortured or abused detainees in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and all the other things we learned that our government is doing as a result of these people of conscience in government coming forward and making us aware of that which our government has tried to hide from us. That is not a subversion of democracy. It is not a crime. It is something that is crucial in a democracy for us as journalists and us as citizens to be able to know what our government is doing. So what else don't we know? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's important to realize that although Edward Snowden was able to provide an enormous amount of information about what the NSA and the GCHQ and CSEC have been doing, um, those are only one agency within these very vast governments. Um, and even within those agencies, he was able to take only some documents, the ones that he was able to access, not all. Um, and I think that really is the principal problem. You can have a debate about surveillance. You can have a debate about whether you want your government bombing other countries constantly or droning them to death and putting people in prison with no charges. Those are all debates to have. But if you believe in democracy, um, you should believe that we have a right as citizens to know what our government is doing. Again, not every detail, but the broad strokes of it. And um, there is an enormous amount that remains secret. Um, and what I hope is that people get inspired by the example of Edward Snowden, like he got inspired by the example of Chelsea Manning, or people got inspired by the example of Daniel Ellsberg. So I actually differ with Edward Snowden just a little bit in that I think that it is important to think about what he did and, and why he did it. And I hope that people in this room and people listening and people of your generation will start to ask themselves hard questions about what their duty as citizens compels them to do and what an act of conscience really means and whether you just go along with bad acts because it's the easier path or whether you measure your worth as a human being based on how much you really believe in the things you say you believe in. And I think these examples are really important to inspire other people because there is so much more that we don't know, both about surveillance, but about broader policies of what our government is doing as well. To follow on that with the yeah, question of simply what don't we know yet, um, the basic theme, uh, as Glenn laid it out, is there's a significant amount of reporting always still to be done. Um, no matter how much we know at any given time, much like science, uh, it builds on itself. There's always more to be done. Government doesn't sleep. It's always working. Um, but most significantly, uh, my accesses would be uh, focused most strongly on the gathering and working of intelligence agencies. The real significant reporting that's still to be done, follow-on reporting that we have not, uh, you know, we don't know who's going to come forward about it. Uh, but we have seen this increasingly happening in the United States, is how this is being used by law enforcement, how this is being used not against people, you know, outside uh, by spying agencies uh, or even inside by spying agencies, but how this comes home to be used by law enforcement and the police. Uh, it inevitably does. We've already seen through actually Glenn Greenwald's reporting um, programs that were once used to target uh, drone strikes and uh, identify terrorists in the Middle East and places like Yemen uh, was revealed by Washington or uh, Wall Street Journal reporting uh, 
I believe, last year, uh, that these programs were being used now in the United States against common criminals. It meant that drones were flying over our cities, monitoring people's cell phones, the wireless cards in their laptops, because they all have unique device identifiers. And if they can find out whose cell phone has what ID, they can track the, the movements of all of these individuals. We saw just recently, uh, on Friday, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada uh, propose a new law. And I'm not an expert on Canadian law. I'll leave the debate to Canadians. You know, they, they're the ones who, who have to live with this. But I would say we should always be extraordinarily cautious when we see governments trying to set up a new secret police within their own countries. When they're asking for intelligence authorities, intelligence powers, which is to say extraordinary powers, to be used in new means, uh, particularly related to political ideologies, uh, radicalization, uh, influence on governments, um, and how people develop their politics, which governments refer to nowadays as radicalization, uh, we need to be very careful about this because this is a process that is very, very easy to begin. It always happens in time of fear and panic, uh, emergency legislation. They, they say we're facing extraordinary threats. And again, if you look at the statistics, while the threats are there, they're typically not as uh, significant as presented. Um, once we let these powers get rolling, it's very difficult to stop that boulder. Uh, so I, I would say we need to use extraordinary scrutiny in every society, in every country, in every city, in every state to make sure that the laws we live under are the ones that we truly want and truly need. Um, I just want to return to what Glenn said about being a sort of concerned citizen and acting as someone who wants to bring this information to light. Um, I think everyone in this room and everyone watching, the, the idea of acting as a concerned citizen for the benefit of your country will resonate with them. However, what the two of you have done does not necessarily resonate with them. I'm sure you've heard this before. There are people in this room who disagree with what you've done, and adamantly so. Why do you believe that is the case? Why are some willing to sacrifice their privacy for the sake of perceived or real security, while others are adamantly opposed to warrantless intrusions. Let me let me just address that quickly first. Um, you know, I would say two things. Uh, people who wield political power are really adept at how to manipulate their populations to get them to acquiesce to that power. Um, that's how they got to become politically powerful in the first place. And so, you know, I think there are two very important human traits to think about. Um, number one is that fear is an extremely potent uh, component of human nature. I mean, just evolutionarily, it's important. Fear is what keeps us away from threats that might kill us. Um, it's a really important part of how we interact with the world. And as a result, people who wield political power for centuries, really for millennia, have exploited fear in order to get people to submit and acquiesce to what they wanted. So if you are a Canadian citizen, think about this fact. If you are a Canadian citizen, you have a greater chance of dying by being struck by lightning or by going to a restaurant and eating a meal that will give you an intestinal disease or by slipping in your bathtub and hitting your head on the ceramic tiles than you do dying in a terrorist attack. The chances that you will die in a terrorist attack are infinitesimal, and yet your government continuously hypes the threat and tells you that unless you give it more and more power, it will um, be incapable of saving you from this threat, of keeping you alive and, and of protecting you, and, and this fear-mongering is a very dangerous yet very effective form of persuading people to submit to things that they otherwise wouldn't submit to. The other aspect of human nature that often gets exploited is authoritarianism, um, a belief that whoever wields power has great wisdom. This is the history of human nature. If you look at repressive institutions, you would think that everybody in the society being repressed by those institutions would inherently be opposed to those institutions. That's just not the case. Lots of people want to follow 
those who are called leaders or those who wield political power. It is a natural human instinct. And so as I said before, the example of Daniel Ellsberg, nobody, almost nobody would today say that what Daniel Ellsberg did was wrong. I mean, how can anybody stand up and say that disclosing documents showing that the government is lying to the population about a war is wrong? But at the time, huge numbers of people said exactly what people say about Edward Snowden now, which is he stole these documents, he broke the law, he disobeyed authority. Sometimes authority itself is corrupt and unjust, and the only just act is to disobey it. Um, Nelson Mandela went to prison for several decades because he did actually break the law, but he did it for a just cause because the authority who he defied was unjust. Um, same with civil rights leaders, same with all kinds of people fighting for justice. And so I think that in order to be rational citizens, we have to make sure that our fears aren't being exploited and that our desire for authoritarianism, to follow strong leaders, um, is something that we're resisting. And then the question just becomes, as a citizen, are you happy that you know that your government is spying on the internet in a mass and indiscriminate way? Or do you sit around wishing that you had remained ignorant of it? And to me, the only rational answer is to say, I may not agree with everything Edward Snowden thinks about surveillance, but I'm really glad as a citizen of a democracy, I now know my government is doing this so that I can participate in the debate and help make those decisions rather than having them made for me. Uh on the question of, you know, uh, some people have criticisms about this, uh, they, they don't like it. This is, this is a reasonable thing. You know, people, people make decisions on the basis of information they have access to. And the media has uh, unnecessarily controversialized this in many ways. Uh, in the United States domestic political debate, uh, unfortunately, a number of our legislators uh, they immediately denounced it because they said it's classified, it's classified, it's classified. They didn't really care about the content. They cared about the, the legality of it, the legalism. And again, we need to think about in social terms the distinction between legality and morality. Now, while this was not said and not accepted when uh, it first happened, when this first took over the news, sometime later, the President of the United States himself uh, agreed that just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. He claimed to commit himself to closing down the same programs that were revealed, some of these mass surveillance programs, uh, saying they weren't necessary and they unnecessarily impacted our rights. Uh, so there, there can be some disagreement about where to draw the line, what's right, what's not right, where the distinctions are. Uh, it's not that you have to uh, agree with uh, me or Glenn or the journalists or scientists or judges or courts or whatever. There's always room for debate. But we need to make sure that we have a real grounding and ultimately our debates are driven by facts. Our understanding of the world is based on a grounding in fact. And when we look at the, uh, the sort of investigations that followed these reportings, even in the United States, the same people who are, you know, uh, basically they were, they were, <laughs> they were individuals in the United States government who said they, they wanted to poison me on the street and have me uh, die collapsing the shower, these, these same individuals, uh, appointed independent panels. Uh, the White House appointed two, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, uh, and there was an independent review group appointed by the president that took a look at these programs. They had full access to classified information, and they went are these programs, you know, uh, valuable? Are they necessary? Are these criticisms accurate? And in fact, not only did they find the criticisms of them were sound, uh, they, they said the programs were not necessary, uh, well, that mass surveillance, particularly the Section 215 uh, phone metadata program, this is an example of spying on everybody in the country as opposed to specific individuals. They found that spying on everybody, that mass surveillance, that bulk collection, that's the government euphemism for it, had never stopped a single imminent terrorist attack, despite the fact that the justification for these programs was that they kept us safe from terrorist attacks. Uh, the facts did not line up with the rhetoric. Uh, in Europe, we saw similar debates. Uh, the European Court of Justice struck down the Data Retention Directive, which was one of their mass surveillance mandates throughout the entire EU. Uh, 
The Council of Europe uh, found, uh, confirmed the, the domestic U.S. findings that these programs were not necessary, that they were not effective, that they should be ended, and that they were fundamentally in conflict with basic rights. And the United Nations also found that these were fundamentally contrary to our rights and needed to be reformed. Uh, every country that looks at these programs and measures them on merit finds that not only are they not necessary, they may actually be harmful. Uh, and this is really something that is not covered to the media or by the media to the same extent that the initial controversy of hero versus traitor was. So some people are still looking at the issue from a June 2013, we don't know what will happen man, uh, mindset, which is reasonable. Because you know when some guy bursts onto the scene and all of these journalists are revealing uh, you know, secret documents, there's a real reasonable fear that maybe this will get people killed. Maybe this will hurt people. But we're now nearly two years out from the initial disclosures. And not a single instance of harm has ever been shown uh, as a result of these disclosures. In, in fact, when we look at it, we see reports that say no harm was caused uh, by it. Uh, and, and not only was there no harm caused by the disclosures, you know, terrorists were still able to look at them. They weren't changing their methods as a result. And this is an independent report, by the way. There was a CIA commissioned report that found a contrary finding, but of course they were paid by the CIA. Uh, small conflict of interest there. But we see that governments, such as the United Kingdom, had kept this information classified as they wrote in their own documents, the documents that they were not sharing with the public, not because they feared harm to national security, but because they feared a damaging public debate, they called it. That's their quote, a damaging public debate that would enable legal challenges on the basis of rights violations. So when we look at this in, in sort of a holistic context with the benefit of history, with the benefit of a broader understanding of facts, and we sort of give weight to that that is distinct from merely rhetorical claims, uh, it's somewhat difficult to, to stand on solid ground in saying that this really caused harm. Now that doesn't mean you have to like that. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to like me or approve of me or, or the reporting or anything like that. But we should be able to agree that this is a good thing for society to know, regardless of the mechanism, regardless of, of how bad a guy I am. Uh, ultimately, the revelation of warrantless wiretapping, of mass surveillance on a global scale is something that we the people deserve to know. And if the government will not tell us, it falls to journalists to work as the free press, as sort of the fourth estate, and find and publish the information that's necessary to inform our voting habits. Ed, we're going to move to question period in just a minute. But before we finish, I have one more question for you. And I want to bring it back to Canada. As you said, it's been two years since the initial release. And when that initial release took place, it shocked the world. Why has it taken two years for the revelations about levitation to come to light? And how long has the CBC had the documents indicating that this activity was going on? Was it a product of, of your waiting, or was it the CBC that waited? So I can't speak to the reporting process because I'm not involved in it. Uh, I, I don't say what to publish, what not to publish. Uh, I don't have any access to documents on my own. Uh, I, I got rid of all material in Hong Kong by providing it to journalists uh, because I didn't want to be compromised. I didn't want to be pressured if I was jailed or at, at risk of torture or anything like that. Uh, so I'll have to defer to Glenn on any sort of journalistic uh, question like that. Yeah, so I'll just answer it this way. Um, I, always, I always find it odd that on the one hand people say, well, aren't you being irresponsible with the documents that you're publishing and disclosing? and um, you know, on the other hand, they say, well, why have you taken so long to study these documents before you've actually disclosed them? Um, and there's obviously a tension between those two questions. Um, we do feel an obligation to try and get relevant information to the public as soon as we can, but we also feel an obligation 
to make sure that what we say about these documents is actually accurate so that we're not misleading the public the way these governments have but are actually informing them um, and to also make sure that we are reporting the material in accordance with the framework we created with our source Edward Snowden about how to do this safely and responsibly. A lot of these documents are really complicated. Um, they take time to understand. They have to be examined with experts. Um, there's documents from multiple countries around the world, in fact countries on every continent around the world, um, and so it takes time, and it takes time to do the reporting and to get the reporting right. Um, we have multiple news outlets around the world reporting on them. Um, there was a holdup with the CBC uh, with one of the stories, in fact the last story that we just did, um, because not everybody at the CBC was on the same page about how to do the reporting, but we got that resolved and are working with great editors and great reporters at the CBC. We've done a lot of stories early on. Um, this one took a little bit longer than I would have liked, but I want to make sure to be very accurate, um, specifically about significant, if not more significant, than the ones we've reported thus far, um, and we're going to report them like we've reported all the stories um, as quickly as we can, consistent with making sure that we're, we're accurate and, and we know that what we're saying is true. Thank you so much to both of you. At this point, we'll be starting the question period. You may have noticed the press desk at the back of the room. If you'd like to ask a question, please go up the sides of the hall. There are pens and paper ready. Write your question down, and then go to the Q&A desk to clear your question. Once it's approved, you may come down and ask the question. We have only two rules. No two-part questions, and please only ask questions that are directly relevant. For example, Mr. Snowden, what is your spirit animal? That would be considered irrelevant. And um, while we may have, may have been kind, feel free to hold them accountable if you feel you need to. I'm sure that they can take tough questions. <laughs> so, um, in terms of spirit animal, by the way, I'm an internet guy, so it's got to be a cat. Um, okay. Uh, do you believe that surveillance of all people uh, is unacceptable? Uh, or would it be justifiable to spy on people with violent criminal past or public association with an extremist group? Uh, for example, say, uh, would it be okay to uh, keep the head of the American Nazi Party under uh, close surveillance? Ultimately, the question of surveillance and how it's applied is a question of law. Uh, this should always be uh, sort of aimed and targeted on the basis not of policy, not of regulation, but of law, with the involvement of courts, except in extraordinary exigent circumstances where it's necessary for the protection of life or property on sort of an imminent basis. You know, they, they say there's a, 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 a bomb that this individual's uh, planted. You know, they, they need to figure out where he is at this time. Uh, and we have laws in place for this, at least in the United States, which will allow you for sort of a 72-hour exemption, but then a judge reviews it, so if you've abused it, it's sort of a problem. Um, but surveillance is, you know, a, a important capability for intelligence and law enforcement. This isn't, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy who says, let's get a, rid of surveillance entirely, you know, uh, sunshine and roses everywhere, because Although we want to get to a point in our civilization where we can do that, where we can say we don't need surveillance anymore. That's not the world we live in yet, and that's not the world we can expect to live in in this sort of uh, foreseeable future. Surveillance is used in, you know, every day in every country for the investigation of serious crimes. And the way we manage that is we make sure it's overseen by courts, and it's not simply done by an agency on the basis of their own say-so. This is the problem in the intelligence context, is we have it done on an untargeted, indiscriminate scale, where it's targeting entire populations as opposed to specific persons. Uh, and on top of that, it's often done without oversight, which is in the case in, in Canada, there's very limited oversight of intelligence uh, agencies uh, there. In the United States, it's also very weak. And even where intelligence uh, agencies have to seek warrants in the United States, 
Currently, it's very weak. They go to a rubber stamp court, not a, a real court you know, uh, that, that's got any sort of meaningful challenge to the government assertions of necessity, of, of need. In the period between the 1980s and, I believe, uh, 2012, 2013, somewhere in there, uh, there were 33,900 warrant requests uh, by the intelligence community to the sort of secret intelligence court. Of those 33,900 requests, only 11 were rejected in a span of about 30 years. When you can only say no 11 times in 30 years, that's a good, uh, good example that perhaps the level of scrutiny necessary to robustly defend the liberties of society is not there. All right, so uh, first of all, thanks so much for coming to speak with us, Mr. Snowden. It's a great honor. Uh, so my question for you, uh, so one of the justifications often provided for surveillance and encroachments on civil liberties um, is spreading liberal democracy and free markets throughout the world. Do progressive ideologies always overstep their bounds, bounds when they violate rights and freedoms with the goal of future prosperity? <laughs> a good question, kind of uh, complex. Uh, so we, we have to think about it in terms of, ultimately, what kind of government do we want uh, for ourselves? How do we want to live? And when we think about it in terms of basic, uh, basic elemental terms, right? what makes a, a proper government, what makes a free society, what makes a liberal society, sort of free markets and, and freedom of speech, all the rights that we enjoy, uh, we have to also think that we want to be free from the encroachment of foreign societies. We don't want you know, an, an African nation to in, invade Canada or the United States and impose their way of life upon us. This is the real challenge uh, of how do we promote uh, liberal society around the world. And ultimately, when we look at the effective methods of spreading our values and the ineffective methods of spreading our values, aggression is never the right way to go. You know, whether it is aggressive use of powers through clandestinity, sort of through assassinations and targeted killings, subversions of governments and their overthrows, uh, or through backing of civil society, uh, through training and, and resourcing and exchange of ideas and commerce, we see that these do work. One of the most significant achievements for liberal society around the world in the last century was the invention and propagation of the internet itself. Suddenly people who had never had access to foreign thinkers, foreign perspectives, new ideas, new products and services had them no matter where they are. Even in China today, despite the Great Firewall, people are able to use technological workarounds virtual private networks, anonymity uh, technology, even going to a hotel or working for a foreign business or, or, or going to a wireless access point that's used by the press at a, at a, a commercial event. People are able to break down these walls, go beyond sort of the authoritarian restrictions of local governments to achieve an access to sort of a robust marketplace of ideas, a community that they could never reach at home. And this works because ultimately governments are determined by their people and when we look at conflicts around the world ultimately we shouldn't be asking how do we govern them to make them like us we simply have to make our societies so attractive make our values so transparently desirable that they want to pursue the same outcomes when we live good lives when we act morally, when we act ethically, when we compete fairly and we win, that's an inspiration that changes the world. And I think that's the way we need to encourage our foreign policy uh, institutions to represent us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snowden. It was a pleasure hearing you speak. You mentioned today, as well as in a TED Talk that you delivered some time ago, that 
this isn't really about you, but what motivates what motivated you to do what you did and to live with your decision? This is a you know this is a question that that I don't think anybody who's been through sort of this kind of circumstance can ever have an enduring answer for it. It changes by the day, it changes by the month, it changes by the hour. Uh, when I lived in Hawaii, I had an extraordinarily high paying job. Uh, I didn't graduate from high school. You know, a lot of people in this room probably are much brighter uh, and more capable, more talented than I am. Um, but despite that lack of high school education, at the high point of my career, I made almost $200,000 a year. At my last position, I made $122,000 a year. You know, that was a significant amount of money to me. I had uh, a partner that I loved. I had a family that I adored, that I was very close to. I, I had a home and a uh, fulfilling career. But I left all of these things behind because I talked to the people in my office when I saw things were wrong, and they agreed that these things were wrong. It's not that you know people at these security agencies are mustache twirling villains, sort of they're evil doers that want to do harm, that want to undermine free societies. Uh, at the working level specifically, these are good people trying to do good things for the right reasons, but they're bounded by regulations, they're bounded by policies, and they're bounded by the orders that they're given by senior leaders, by political leaders that sort of impose uh, a level of control and authority upon them. Now, beyond that, there's also a level of fear. When I asked, you know, when I showed, for example, the, the images of boundless informant to my coworkers that showed the level of mass surveillance, you know, hundreds of millions of collection events happening domestically within the United States, happening within countries that are our allies, uh, on a bulk, indiscriminate, you know, untargeted basis. And I said, have you seen this? You know, this is crazy. And it's in the context of the most senior intelligence officer in the United States, James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, raising his hand in front of Congress, swearing to tell the truth about programs, then being directly asked by a senator, does the United States collect millions or hundreds of millions of records, you know, any kind of uh, events monitoring on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans uh, through any means, and he said, no, no, sir, not wittingly, it does not. He knew that was a lie. The senator who asked him the question knew it was a lie because he was privy to the classified information. He was on the intelligence committees overseeing these programs. And he told James Clapper you know, that that was a lie. And he asked him to amend his, uh, his testimony, and he did not. Now, the problem here was the senators on the intelligence committee, they knew it was a lie. The uh, director of national intelligence, he knew it was a lie. The people in the intelligence community, we all knew it was a lie. But the 330 million Americans that vote, that are supposed to have a role in our government, were completely misled. They were all lied to despite the oath, despite the raised hand. And that fundamentally undermines the, the credibility of our government, the value of our societies. And it puts us at risk, again, of having the decisions that matter most about the way we live, about the boundaries of the rights that we enjoy in our societies, being made increasingly behind closed doors. And, and once that happens, we're out of it. So how did I make this decision, and, and was I OK with it? It, it got to the point where I, I've, I've sort of said to, to people, there's no one event. Now, there, there are catalyzing events, the Clapper event, uh, the Supreme Court rejecting this, saying, hey, we can't rule on this. We'll just trust the executive branch, you know, the prime minister, the president, whoever, uh, to do the right thing on this. But ultimately, it comes down to everybody has a limit to what they can see. And when I joined the Central Intelligence Agency, I was made to swear enough to defend the Constitution of my country against all enemies. And it specifically says all enemies, not just foreign, but domestic. Not to defend the agencies, not to defend the president, but the Constitution, our rights, the foundation of our government against these threats. And we have this limit, a line of incivility and inhumanity and immorality, of wrongdoing. We can see and witness, you know, we turn our, our face away from the beggar asking for change in the cold and the snow, whatever, uh, because there's only so much we can deal with. 
But once it passes that point, we have to do something about it. And when I saw the constitution of my country being violated on a massive scale, and my colleagues agreed that something needed to be done, but none of them were willing to do it because they knew what happens to people you know, who stand up and challenge power, I realized that I was in a place to do something about it. And I felt that I had a civic obligation to do so, and I, I did the best I could in the context. And ultimately, it wasn't about uh, it wasn't about fairy tale endings. It wasn't about you know being a hero. It was about trying to do something because something must be done. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for what you've done. I think it's really admirable and very courageous. Um, so to my question, under what specific circumstances do we abandon legal channels and pursue um, civil disobedience to see change? <laughs> that's a really good question, and that's, uh, that's one I'm sure your parents would not want me to answer. Um, <laughs> but. You know, this is, this is ultimately an individual decision. When we look back at the course of history, uh, again, it gets back to democracy is about participation. It's about the contest of ideas. We make risks. We dare. We chance. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we lose. Sometimes we do right. Sometimes we do wrong, even though we intended to do right. But the result of this is that when you see something that you realize is so morally unjustifiable that you are moved to act regardless of the consequences. You have some method of mitigating harm to, to ensure that you're not going to be you know, uh, unfairly, uh, unfairly undermining the rights and liberties of the people around you, their safety, their security, their lives, and their livelihoods. Uh, and you look to history. You look and see, are there any models? You know, I, I had Daniel Ellsberg, who was a personal inspiration uh, to me, who looked at this. And people asked him, what did he regret about it? Did he do something wrong? You know, was there something he could have done better? And I've, I've met with him privately, and he, he's told me something that had a tremendous impact on me, which was he did have a regret. The regret that he had was that he didn't come forward sooner. If he had come forward earlier, if he had not waited, he possibly could have shortened the war by even more. He could have saved lives. And so many you know, uh, unnecessarily, unnecessary deaths occurred as a result of the Vietnam War. Not just American lives, but Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotian. Um, and it, it's this kind of thing. Can you, mit uh, can you mitigate the harms that are a result of your action? Uh, and can you ensure there will be, to the best of your uh, judgment, a greater public good than any potential risk, any potential harm that could come out of this? And you see, it's, it's difficult to do things when it's, when it's an edge case, when, OK, this might be good, this might not be good. It needs to be clear wrongdoing. It needs to be something that no one reasonably would expect is fair. When we look at slavery, the Underground Railroad, when we look at Oscar Schindler, and uh, you know, protecting uh, the Jewish community in, in Nazi Germany, helping them uh, to uh, be protected. These, these are things where you look at them and they were violations of law that were clear. Uh, all of the policies in Nazi Germany, uh, in, in, in the slavery period in America, these were legal. These were lawful. Uh, it was the government that was in the right in terms of law. And it, were, it was the, the dissident class that was, that was wrong. Uh, and they stood a great legal peril, you know, pain of death, uh, if they were caught. But ultimately, you have to look at this and you have to go, what can I live with? And you have to think about, is it possible that if I do something, I can change this? Can I save lives? Can I protect rights? Will this make a difference? And will this inspire? Could this change our politics? Could this change our thinking? Could this result in a more free, more liberal society? And you know, I, I can't tell you where to draw the lines on that. 
But I think uh, anybody who's in that situation, who has the time to think long and hard about it, uh, they can come to a pretty clear distinction about what is right and what is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as you described it, um, currently the government is using mass metadata collection as a primary investigative tool. Um, and I kind of see this as being similar to police searching your suitcase in an airport. Um, isn't this also a violation of a citizen's privacy for public safety? And how is one justified and not the other? That's a very good question. There is a, a the border search exemption, as it's called in the United States, where sort of we have this Fourth Amendment protection uh, from unreasonable searches and seizures. They say when you're crossing the border, you don't have the same expectation of rights uh, because there's a overwhelming sort of presiding government uh, obligation to protect it at this, this limited, particularly dangerous point. Now, we don't see this sort of limited, particularly dangerous point uh, in metadata collection because it's being applied to everyone all the time. And unlike the border searches, it's creating records of our activities, which is significant, uh, because it enables things like retroactive surveillance, retroactive searching, where let's say you've lived your life as an honest citizen all day long, uh, you know, your entire life, but one day you come up on the radar and suddenly they can go back and search through the last five years, eight years, ten years, however long that data storage happens to be at the point that this occurs, and look for wrongdoing. Uh, and we know, uh, based on history, uh, that when you create these sort of centers of gravity in terms of databases, uh, academics refer to them as databases of ruin, where you aggregate enough information about individuals, uh, it is simply too irresistible to any actor, and this isn't just governments, this is corporations as well. Uh, when the data set reaches a certain point of richness, the temptation to use it for new and novel purposes that were not originally justified at, at the point of its creation simply cannot be resisted, and that fundamentally uh, puts us at risk of harm. Now, there, there can be some arguments made about, you know, is this valuable here, there, and, and elsewhere, but metadata surveillance could be done on a targeted basis. You know, uh, they've done that in the United States for many years. Uh, under what's called a pen register or trap and trace authorities, where they say, this individual uh, we don't have a warrant for, but we have a reasonable suspicion of wrongdoing, which is the same thing at the border. You know, they see this individual. They don't search everybody's search suitcase who walks up the border. They go, this individual is suspicious for these reasons, uh, and on that basis, we'll use our authority to, to make this specific target search. Now, Intelligence agencies are applying this bulk collection, these metadata authorities, on uh, without the basis of reasonable suspicion. It, it's affecting everybody. That's what I would say is the key distinction, is targeting. Uh, metadata collection is by its very nature indiscriminate when you're doing it from bulk content collection of the entire internet communications. Border searches are happening uh, simply on the basis of resources. They've only got so many officers, so many people they can search a day on a targeted basis. Technology unchains the government and these authorities from the necessity of targeting. And on that basis, it violates the principles of necessity and proportionality that are supposed to oversee the use and application of surveillance authorities. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Snowden. So my question is, obviously, your life has changed greatly since the documents have been leaked. Um, what is your life like now? And could you maybe describe an average day in your life? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's funny because one would assume after this thing kind of happens and, you know, you're wanted and, you know, there, there's warrants out and all this craziness that it might be a little bit like a, sort of a messed up vacation, you know, you, you, you go underground, you relax, but 
I actually work more now than I ever did before. I work seven days a week uh, practically. Um, it's now uh, about 4.30 in the morning here, I guess, and I, I haven't gone to sleep yet. But it's tremendously satisfying. Uh, I'm able to have so much impact. Uh, I, I work on the board of directors of the Freedom of the Press Foundation in the United States. Uh, I work closely with civil liberties and advocacy groups around the world. I work with uh, computer scientists, experts in cryptography. Uh, I've been fortunate to be invited to have debates at, at places like Harvard University and here. There is a tremendous ability to contribute that has been opened up to me that despite the costs uh, to me personally, to my family, um, uh, has really allowed me to, to regret nothing. Thank you. First of all, thank you uh, to both of you, Mr. Snowden and Mr. Greenwald, for coming to speak with us today. Um, my question is, given China's rise and its capacity and potential to supplant the United States as a global hegemon, uh, and understanding um, their traditional willingness uh, to exercise control digitally or, or over a digi person's digital lives, uh, how do you think uh, their rise will affect global privacy and global security in the years to come? First off, wow. High school students? I mean, these are, <laughs> these are better questions than I get from members of parliament. But uh, but when we when we talk about China, when we talk about the impact it'll have, again, this comes down to international norms, international standards, and ultimately what we what we expose ourselves to. The beauty of the revelations of 2013 is they revealed ways that we can fix this potential solutions, methods we can use to protect the communications of individuals even at, at the most risk, who are the most vulnerable in the most authoritarian places on earth, uh, and ensuring that our rights are protected irrespective of borders, you know, it, because ultimately you can have the most responsible surveillance regime uh, in the world operating in Canada or the United States or France or China or wherever. But because it's an interconnected world and an interconnected internet, as soon as your communications pass outside the borders of Canada to the United States, then they hop across the ocean, every state that it crosses through has an opportunity to monitor it, to surveil it. Now, in regard to China and, and sort of this, uh, the way we ensure that our rights will be protected is to ensure that we have methods of security that apply universally on the basis of our technological standards. We cannot simply enforce our rights through laws because laws, national laws, can, are optional to you know, international parties. If we apply things such as end-to-end -end encryption, ways of armoring your communications, so let's say you're uh, sending a communication from a Canadian uh, client to a French server, only the endpoint in France and the originator in Canada can decrypt that communication and read it. By doing this, you protect things in transit. So when we think about China and the impact they'll have, their rise is concerning. They have a significant amount of clout. They have an expanding uh, technological industrial base. Uh, and, and they have much more influence uh, because their economy is booming than they have historically. However, when we talk about the cooperation of Western society, it has no peer. And ultimately, we still set the technical standards for the world. So when it comes to the level of interference that you know, some sort of authoritarian state, and it doesn't have to be China, it could be anybody you could name, uh, ultimately the answer to that is they can only get away with what we will allow. If we are willing to ensure that we in Canada or the United States or Germany or wherever cannot uh, indiscriminately monitor these communications because they're protected even against our own attacks by a sort of the necessary inverse it's also protected against our adversaries uh, attacks by protecting us from some 
Well, basically, we have security for everyone or we have security for no one. Cybersecurity is something that applies without regard to nationality or borders. The way we do this is we cut out back doors. We say, never here. It's not going to be a part of our standards. We mandate robust security. And through our laws, we enforce robust uh, liability on corporations that do not uh, apply the necessary level of protection to the communications of their customers, their clients. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to discuss this very pressing issue with you. I'd like to present you with a hypothetical. This question is directed towards you, Mr. Snowden. Let's assume Putin and the Russian government have now employed you to Russia's FAPSI. For all intents and purposes, it is the NSA equivalent operating within the ranks of the Russian government. While working there, you are to discover that Russia, too, engages in these privacy invasive programs and policies against their own citizens. Seeing the fallout that has and the results and repercussions of what you did in 2013, would you leak this reality to the public a second time and why or why not? Of course, because practice makes perfect. I mean, when, when we look at this kind of thing, uh, if I had access to that, that information, and that same wrongdoing was occurring, which I think is quite clear is very likely, um, you know, it doesn't matter which nation uh, does it. Wrong is wrong. And if we have an opportunity to challenge that, if we have an opportunity to resist it, we have an opportunity to change it, stand up and do something about it. The costs, I can say from experience, are much smaller uh, relative to the, the, the peace of mind that comes from being satisfied with the decisions you made. You know, nobody sits on their deathbed and thinks about, oh man, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't do this, that, or the other. You know, human, human life is about taking risks. It's about taking chances. And it's ultimately about, I believe, the path of self-realization that, that brings us to the point where we go, it's not enough to believe in something. It's not enough to advocate for your beliefs. Ultimately, you can't just believe in something. You have to stand for something. And standing for something implies risk. And I mean, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's all I can say. Yeah, they, they probably shouldn't give me access to, to Russian secret wiretapping material. So. Thank you very much. So thank you again so much for coming to speak to us. Uh, my question is about resisting surveillance. Clearly, at present, the government surveillance apparatus has run so deep that no member of society could potentially stop being surveilled unless they hold themselves up, like quite literally. Um, Mr. Greenwald, you've spoken about how knowledge of surveillance affects our psyche and our social behavior negatively. So my question is, Mr. Snowden, despite your revelations, is it in our best interest to resist surveillance? And if not, is surveillance justified if people are tacitly accepting it? I think resistance to any immoral activity, unethical activity, is uh, something that should be promoted regardless of effectiveness. Um, now, there is always a question of resourcing. You know, we only have so many hours in the day, so many things we can do, so many things we can commit ourselves to. However, application of mass surveillance is... applied methods and systems of mass surveillance that have uh, significantly increased the powers of their uh, intelligence bureaus, their state security offices, uh, that did not ultimately result in a slow authoritarian decline. Uh, sometimes it's much more rapid. Um, and we need to, again, think back to how does this happen? Uh, even when you're thinking about historical examples of, of very bad states, you know, the, the, the Stasi, um, and the Gestapo, you know, really abusive uh, surveillance and secret police uh, groups, 
they didn't see themselves as the bad guys. They saw themselves as societies facing extraordinary external threats. They were trying to protect their nation, their government, against these threats. They saw themselves as the sword and shield protecting the civilian, the common man, in, as they go about their daily life. And this is something... Well, that was going to be the last question. Um, I'm sure he'll be back in a minute. I apologize. It, it, it seems like I, I lost the call at some point. Uh, if Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, apologies for that. I'm not sure where I lost you, so I'll, I'll just try to summarize. Uh, ultimately, the way to avoid that sort of creeping authoritarianism, and you know, it's a mistake to think that we're above it, that it can't happen here. Uh, this, this can happen anywhere at any time, uh, is to resist. Ineffective resistance is better than no resistance. But we want to focus on increasing our effectiveness, on doing the most we can, having the most impact, persuading the most people, inspiring the most people to remember that even in times of extraordinary threat, even in times where there are real dangers, when there are foreign adversaries, that's when it matters the most that we defend our liberties and defend our values. Because ultimately, it's not about beating all of our enemies. We cannot subjugate and take over the world, no matter how effective we are. We have to figure out how we can lead the world by creating networks of allies, by converting enemies into friends, and finding a way ultimately that will lead to the end of conflict, build lasting peace. And the only way to arrive at this is to come across, protect, support, advocate, and defend universal values that we can all recognize and we can all respect. Thank you so much. Go ahead. On behalf of more than the 900 community members here today, I would like to thank you both for your time. And before you go, Carl and I have a request. We would both like to take a selfie with you. I better see that on Twitter. Mr. Snowden, Mr. Greenwald, speaking to you has been an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Watch out for the weather. Drive safe. <laughs>